Hey folks, and welcome to another Billet Labs video. Now, if you have ever water-cooled your computer before, you've probably either used this, which is a D5 pump, or this, which is a DDC pump. Now, the D5 pump is an almost perfect design. It is self-water-cooled by the water that flows through it. So this top section here is metal, and then when you have some kind of pump top on it, the water flows through and it cools the internals of the pump. But if you have quite a restrictive loop, as in there's lots of components or lots of radiators or lots of fittings, then the D5 pump might not be able to give you the head pressure that you need to pump the water around it. Or you might be building in a very small system, in which case you're going to be using the DDC pump, which has better head pressure and is obviously much smaller. The bad thing about the design of the DDC pump is that it is not self-water cooled. So it generates heat inside the base here, and even though you might have a nice metal pump top on the top, most of the heat needs to escape through the base and the water flowing through the top doesn't cool it enough to consider it a water-cooled pump. In fact, the internet, especially Reddit, is full of horror stories of people who have burnt out their DDC pumps. Some people have got through multiple DDC pumps in one generation of PC build. And that is because if you can't have air constantly flowing past your pump, it's going to overheat and it's going to burn out. So in this video, we're going to do a deep dive into the cooling of DDC pumps. We're going to try various tops, various bottoms, and then we are also going to unveil our design for our first water-cooled DDC pump. Now to start things off, this is what you get when you buy a standard DDC pump. It has an injection molded plastic top and bottom, it has no thermal pad, no cooling at all, and it's also the 20 watt version of the pump. You can get these from 8 watts up to 20 watts. We've gone for the most powerful one. So this is kind of the worst case scenario you can have for a DDC pump. This is going to be as hot as it can get and it's going to make a good benchmark for the rest of the testing. So we have Sam here in the video today. Hello. And apart from being the other co-owner of Billet Labs, he's also really good at making dad noises while he reads instruction manuals. Compensate. Here you go. Press that button or that button. And the instruction manual he's reading is for our new thermocouple data logger. So glad it comes with a CD which means we're going to get nice temperature graphs for each of the tests. So once I've done a fairly average job of soldering on the thermocouple to the base of the pump, good enough, it was time to start the testing. And we learned some lessons throughout the testing, but the basic methodology is to run the pump for half an hour until it's reached its equilibrium temperature. We're running it through a loop we've rigged up, which is just a big 280 millimeter radiator and this big glass jar as a reservoir. And that just means the water temperature is not going to affect the testing. We're also recording the water temperature and the ambient temperature throughout each test. And because I've never actually used one of these pumps with the standard top on, okay, attach. It turned out I was quite unfamiliar with how tight the assembly screws need to be done up. So the first test didn't go so well. Is it attached? Yeah. Oh, water is leaking. Up. Oh, okay. F Whoa. Oh, but after drying out the flooded pump and reassembling it quickly, we were good for the testing to begin. Ready? Yeah. And our arm pumps on. Nice. Okay, great. And we were quite shocked to see how quickly the temperature spiked here. It was in the 50s within about 20 minutes and ended up peaking at 58.2 degrees. Now, because we have a very well cooled loop, the ambient temperature and the water temperature here, we are measuring both, but they are almost exactly the same. So just for ease throughout this video, the figure we're going to be comparing is the temperature over ambient, which is essentially the same as the temperature over water. And with this first test, the temperature over ambient was 31.9 degrees. So if you're running your DDC pump completely standard with no modifications, it is gonna get pretty toasty. From what I can find, these pumps are rated up to 60 degrees, so we were very close to that. And that's not taking into account the water being warm or the ambient air being warm. So we're now gonna test what happens if we take this apart, put a thermal pad in the bottom. Yeah, I can feel some good squish there. Mm -hmm. And then rerun the test. Three, two, one. 26, 0, and just putting this pad in took 7 degrees off the temperature. So if you are running a pump without a thermal pad in, put a thermal pad in. You know, it's a super cheap, easy change to make and it can save your pump in theory. So who'd have thought thermal pads do help, but the temperature is still very close to the maximum temperature that is recommended for these pumps. So once it's in a case or it has warm water flowing through it, I'm still not convinced that this is going to survive indefinitely. 
Now the next thing we want to test is whether the material of the pump top actually affects the cooling at all. Now as I said these aren't water cooled through the top but some of the heat is naturally going to spread up to the top and be carried away by the water. Now I think we're in quite a unique position because we make an identical design of pump top in multiple materials. Now we already sell these black acetal ones and these brass ones but for this video we've also custom made this solid copper one. The geometry of all of these pump tops is identical and also the thermal conductivity of copper, brass and acetal are all so different. So this will be a really good side-by-side -side test to see if the material of the pump top affects the cooling of the pump. And we're testing all three of these tops with the standard bottom with the thermal pad inside. And this is probably a good point to add our normal disclaimer that we do with any testing. And that is that while we do the best that we can and we try to be as scientific as possible, our testing is far from perfect. Our workshop is in a fairly old, crumbling building, the windows leak, the sun shines through the window, our equipment as well could be better. We've got this thermocouple kit but we don't know that we've calibrated it perfectly. We're also walking around the room a lot, we're creating air currents, our bodies are giving off heat. And also, while we're doing our best to be objective, there's always going to be a bit of bias when you're testing your own products. It's impossible to remove that. So in summary, we're doing our best with these tests. But differences of fractions of a degree, as far as we're concerned, don't really prove anything. And that leads quite neatly into the results of this pump top material test, because there is less than a degree of difference between the acetal top and the copper top. I think basically what this proves is that if someone asks, does your pump top material affect the cooling of your pump? The answer is kind of... Yeah, maybe a little bit, but the data is absolutely not enough to say that using a metal pump top will increase the lifespan of your pump. So next up we're going to be testing the bases and we have the original plastic base that came with the pump and we're going to be comparing that with this aftermarket EK aluminium base. It's a lot bigger, it's got a lot more thermal mass and we're going to be running both with a thermal pad and see how they perform. And as expected, the giant lump of aluminium absolutely wipes the floor with the flimsy piece of plastic. I don't think anyone expected otherwise, but the 13.5 degree improvement is quite a decisive win for the EK pump bottom. So now it is water cooling time and I'm going to try and explain our idea that we've had for the water cooled version of the DDC pump. So just looking at these aftermarket bases, it seems silly to me that there is a heat producing component in here that radiates heat out the bottom while right on top there is a load of water traveling through it. So rather than trying to dissipate the heat through the cooling fins on the bottom, why don't we thermally bridge the bottom to the top and have the water that's flowing through it cool the pump? Now you might be thinking that you can already do this, just get a metal top and a metal bottom, but you can't because this EK bottom is made so that the pump sits inside it and the only metal part that would be in contact with a pump top on here is this rim around the edge and if you look at our pump top the contact patch between the metal on the metal is fractions of a millimeter in each corner there is no point where you can transfer heat from the bottom to the top other than on that tiny little corner where it overhangs now yes you could get around this by getting a bigger brass pump top this is an alpha cool one, for example. This is plastic, but you can get metal pump tops in this size. And yeah, you could do that, and that would thermally bridge the bottom to the top. You could put some thermal paste around here, and that might achieve a water-cooled pump. However, look at the size of that compared to that. It's insane. And one of the main points of using a DDC pump is space saving. So as far as we're concerned, this is not a good solution. So here's our idea for a water-cooled pump base. Now this is the same size as the standard plastic base. The copper down here is as thin as half a millimetre at some point, so it's very, very small and compact. But up in these corners we have this flat area of copper in each corner. That way, if we put on our copper top, you have very good metal-on-metal -metal contact, and that should take all the heat from the base, conduct it up to the top, and the water will take the heat away. That's the idea anyway, so we need to make one. And one of the great things about manufacturing your products in the country that you live in is that you can go and see your machinists and film the machining process. So this is Alex, he does a lot of work for us and he's taken our drawings for this pump bottom, programmed them onto the machine, and then this block of copper gets machined from one side. Hey, 
and then gets flipped over to add the machine details on the other side. That looks amazing. Oh yeah. And here is the finished machined piece. Now, as well as cooling well, we wanted this to be really functional. So you'll see on the bottom, we've got these big M10 screws. And the idea is that we all supply this with the fitting screws in like that. And then there's these little M10 to M4 converter nuts, which will screw in here, which still allow your Allen key to go through to access the screw and rotate that. And that then gives you a fixing on the back so that you can bolt it to something or add on these little sound isolating feet. But the main question is how well does it cool? But before finding that out, mostly out of curiosity, we're gonna see how well it works just by itself as an air cooled base with a non-conductive top. So we're just gonna add that to the tests that we did with the EK and the standard base just to see how it compares to these two. We're not expecting it to beat the EK because this is such a big lump of metal. It's got more thermal mass and it's got cooling fins on it. But let's see how it does anyway. And yeah, as expected, it is a lot better than the standard bottom, over 10 degrees better, but still three degrees off the EK one. But that's not what this copper bottom is for. It's part of a water-cooled enclosure. We weren't expecting it to do well by itself. So we're gonna do a comparison with our copper bottom with our copper top on against the EK bottom with our copper top on. It's the moment of truth. Let's see if it works. And just before doing this test, we realized that the logo on the bottom of the EK base actually protrudes slightly out of the bottom, which meant there was an air gap when it was lying flat on the table, whereas our base is machined flat on the bottom, so that didn't happen. So in the interest of fairness across both tests, we've intentionally raised both bases off the table. And that raising it up clearly helped a lot because the temperature to beat, the temperature that this achieved was 3.3 degrees over ambient. So coming into this test, we were both a bit nervous by this point. We had a very impressive temperature to beat now. We've been at this all of today, plus, so it's, we're 14 hours in? Yeah, I think so. Um, this is incredibly good news. It's all been leading up. Yeah, to this, to this, this is moment. exactly what we're trying to test. And it works better than we thought it would, I think. <laughs> Miles better. Oh my word. I would not have guessed that at all. I thought when I was going through this, I was just like, okay. These are hitting 50, 50. Well, like I, was, I was just hoping it would do better than the EK one. Mm, because mm. If, it, if it performs the same as that, then it's way smaller. So that's an advantage. Exactly, same yeah. performance in a smaller package. But it didn't perform the same as the EK one. After half an hour of testing, we peaked at 1.1 degree over ambient temperature. So that's pretty awesome. We were very happy with that. <laughs> Again, a quick disclaimer though on this one, the water temperature somehow was about half a degree colder than the ambient temperature. So technically we're 1.6 over water temperature, 1.1 over ambient. That's probably to do with our slightly incorrectly calibrated thermocouples. But we use the same thermocouples for both tests. So clearly a win for the water-cooled DDC pump. And the other good thing about it is that if you put it around this way, it makes a happy little face. So throughout these tests, we've really been representing the worst case scenario for air-cooled pumps. And by that, I mean we've been running the pumps at 100% speed. We've been testing them on a insulating wooden bench with no airflow. So you could argue that this isn't really an accurate side-by-side -side test between the water-cooled and the air-cooled pumps. However, that was kind of the point. Most DDC pumps don't burn out. The ones that burn out are usually stuffed in a corner somewhere with no airflow. And we try to create products that allow you to do builds that you possibly couldn't do without them. So we wanted to test these pumps in quite a punishing environment. That being said, we did actually do one more test with the air-cooled pump to try and get it to beat the water-cooled pump. So I've got a load of thermal putty and I'm just going to try and mush it in everywhere. So this whole thing is encased in a thermally conductive blob. I 
tell you what this is the exact colour of. You know, in uh, the first Harry Potter movie where Hagrid bakes in that cake and it's like, <laughs> yeah, happy birthday, yeah, Harry. Yeah. We then reassembled the pump and placed it on top of a box directly in front of the radiator and the fans. And remember, this radiator is effectively putting out no heat. So this is essentially a room temperature fan pointed directly at the cooling fins of the pump. And even with all of this, it actually performed worse by around half a degree compared to that same setup sitting flat on the table with just a thermal pad. And we think the reason for this is probably that the thermal pad has a thermal conductivity of 13, whereas the putty is only 4. So I think putting the putty on the bottom of the pump actually had a negative effect because it had less thermally conductive material to get through before it got to the normal thermal pad and then the aluminium. But at the end of the day, we didn't really consider that test to be scientific enough because we had multiple variables that we changed in that one test. So that's why we didn't really include it in the main section of the video. But I think we really have proven beyond any reasonable doubt that this copper pump housing is not only possibly the smallest, but also maybe the best cooled DDC pump housing that you can buy. And yes, you can buy it. We are taking pre-orders now on our website. Uh, you get a discount if you pre-order and we'll be doing a production run over the next few months. So delivery should be around September of this year, but it's all scratched up. So I need to give it a polish so I can take some photos for the website. And there we go. I absolutely love the look of this thing. If you like it as well, head on over to our website if you want to pre-order one. If bare copper isn't your thing, we're also offering a matte black and a polished nickel finish. So it should be able to suit the vibe of whatever build you are putting together. Anyway, that is it from us. Thank you so much for watching everyone and we'll see you in the next video.